that tour through uh, the use of speech recognition within captioning and the challenges that that, that poses in the real world. Um, and talk about when it really get good enough to, uh, to do, will we ever get to that sort of um, perfect moment? Um, so just to uh, follow on from the introduction, I, I'm the VP of Knowledge for Speechmatics. We're a Cambridge company uh, from the UK. And we specialize in uh, machine learning, specifically around speech recognition. Uh, we focus especially on that speech to text portion of the problem, but we do that really well. So I have been at Speechmatics for the last two years and I've done a good bit. And at that time, we've not just focused on the accuracy of speech recognition, but really worked on how to make it real world and deployable and accessible and really useful in that space. Uh, we have a great team of engineers, machine learning engineers, uh, data scientists and, and speech experts in our team. And we continue to develop and innovate in this space um, to make it better and better. So today I'm with you. Hi, my name is Houston Maxwell. I'm the head of technology development for Active Services and Redby Media. Redby Media is a global media services company offering end-to-end -end media services solutions such as playout, media management, distribution, uh, OTT platforms, metadata, and our part, uh, Access Services. Um, in Access Services, we provide about 200,000 hours of captioning a year. Um, we work across a number of countries and many languages, although primarily in English, but also French, Spanish, Dutch, etc. Um, providing so much captioning uh, across the world all of the time, we really have come to learn what it is people consider to be perfection and, and think a lot about how it is we can go about delivering that. Um, now there are two main types of captioning. One of them is, there we go, we've got some slides. Uh, the first of which is pre-recorded. That's where you get the media in advance and that means you can spend time working on it. You can get it to be really just right. The, the captions are perfectly synchronized and so forth. And the other is real time, where you're doing something that if, if you guys could speak to the mic, I'll grab one of these oh, mics. Sure. That's that what you need. Do I need to turn it on? Or is it? No. Hello? Okay. Um, real time is for things like broadcast news, sports, etc., where it's played out in real time. So there's no time to perfect those captions. Uh, there tends to be a little bit of latency because of the production method. And uh, yeah, so it has a certain effect on expectations. Uh, in the last decade plus, there has been a huge drive in the Western world, especially towards uh, increasing regulation on uh, captioning. So in a lot of mainstream channels in a lot of countries now, the expectation is near 100% coverage of all of your programming. Uh, these high volumes have also driven a huge pressure on cost, because for broadcasters, this has become a major bit of a budget for them, and they're always looking a way to deliver quality captions, but for less. Um, in terms of the expectations of what perfection is, uh, perfection for pre-recorded, or at least the best standard we can reach today, is perfection, it's 100%. Um, pre-recorded captions, any latency or any incorrect words tend to be seen as a major error. For real time, it's different. Because it is real time, there, there is always going to be a little bit of latency. There are a few things you can do, but in general, some latency is inevitable, and also there are generally always going to be some errors. Usually the aspiration is to get to 98%, 99% of the NER, which means you will see the occasional error, but the meaning will always be clear. Uh, sorry. Yeah, so because of this constant pressure on price but the need to deliver quality, we're always looking in Redmi for new ways to deliver uh, captions or for ways to push in our costs without affecting the quality. And one of the core technologies in this is obviously uh, automatic speech recognition or speech to text. Um, we use that widely, and although no ASR engine today will get you by itself to the quality you can get with a traditional human driven process, it is clearly something that is enabling us to do particularly pre recorded for cheaper and also to do new types of live captioning where the quality might be slightly less, but it is still fundamentally useful as an accessibility. Show here this week. Um, when you're making use of ASR to produce captions, you have to do a lot of analysis of the output because some of it is more usable than others. You need to know where it is going to serve you, where it's not, and 
through that cost of analysis, you come to learn where the issues really are uh, for this particular use case. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to talk through <coughs> our big headaches in the captioning side, and hopefully Ian is going to tell me how he's going to fix them for us mm -hmm. and get rid of those headaches. Yeah. So the biggest issue we face is the acoustic environment. Noise is a huge challenge. We generally don't get unmixed audio. We generally don't get a channel of clean audio from the studio. What you get is a pre-mixed broadcast material that has noise over it, it has music, it has overlapping speech. And as a result of this, whenever you've got that background noise, the accuracy drops right down. In fact, it means that for offline groups, we can only use it on about 40% of our content. Because on the others, it's not that it's garbage necessarily, it's just that correcting it is more time consuming than doing it from scratch. So there have been improvements here uh, with your engine we've seen over the last year. There's still some distance to go. Uh, please, make me feel better. <laughs> so, the promise will really any substitution to have that really good, clean audio feed. Noise is the enemy of speech recognition, both humans and for, them, and for computers. The thing is, with humans, we use a lot of context. We've got some history about things that might happen in the past. We've got visual, visual cues of, if I'm watching a program about the schools, and I'm not sure what they heard, I can probably work out that I should be a teacher, not a preacher, for, for example. Um, so, it's difficult for everyone, and we use that context to fill in the gaps, but computers just don't have that context, so they can't, they can't do it that way. Um, and having said that, um, you can't really just pre process the audio either to get rid of the noise, because um, if you tamper with the input, um, you move the input further away from the training data that you use to build the speech system, and actually the accuracy goes, goes down. Um, and noise is not just that sort of continuous air conditioning buzz that might be in the background of the broadcast, but it's dogs barking, it's other people speaking in the background, and it's kind of impossible to um, filter that stuff out, it's just not possible. So the best solution we have is to make sure that we train the speech recognition models on really representative data, you know, that's close to the actual data we're trying to um, capture as possible. Um, now, the good news in broadcast is there's a lot of that available, so that's really great. But where it isn't available, you can take clean audio and you can superimpose you know, car horns on it and, and other sorts of noise to simulate that. And um, we've been doing that really over the last year. We've been adding more and more of that noise into our noisy data into our models, and it's been making uh, really good improvements forwards in that, in that uh, those conditions. We'll continue to continue to do that, and I think it will get better. There are, however, like I mentioned earlier, I think some things that just aren't solvable. Where you've got two people or more mixed down onto a single channel, and there's over talk and interruptions, um, that gets really difficult, again, for humans as well as computers, but really hard for computers. And the sort of technical solution to that from the speech recognition world is to try and keep the channels separate and transcribe them completely separate so they don't have an impact on each other. And you can actually get some really good results that way. But there's a technical challenge there. And I don't know actually whether in the captioning world that's actually something that's viable to, to do to help that. I mean, one of the things that might may help with this is there's an increasing drive towards object-based audio where you mix the channels in the receiver rather than mixing them ahead of time. And you just contain information about that mix in a world where audio is being delivered in that way and the components are being delivered in that way, that will become possible. And sometimes you might get a certain approach in a live broadcast where they have it all mic'd up and they decide to roll this captioning process out of the studio rather than out of the broadcast chain. And there, there it's possible, but that's not the most usual use case we come across, unfortunately. Okay, so the next biggest issue is probably uncommon vocabulary. So broadcast material is often covering very, very specific subjects. I mean, you get farming programs and hobby programs, and even the news, the, what is topical in the news, the places, the names that are coming up, um, changes from day to day. I mean, recently we've had the Mueller report come out as the Mullah, as in religious Mullah report. There's always things like this. As new, as new stories come, you get these words that haven't been seen. And because ASR is generally uh, about picking out the most probable set of words, the most probable set of words, or the most general set of words, and therefore with specificity, there's always a bit of a challenge. We've had a few approaches towards this over the years. I mean, we looked at training custom models for particular genres and use cases, but it's not great when you've got new information coming in, and also we tend to see it gets the specific vocabulary right more often, but the overall grammaticality goes down, and that cost, you know, whether you have to fix
fix a preposition or fix a proper noun, you still have to fix it, and prepositions are more common. So in the end, we decided that wasn't going to be fruitful for us. Um, in our captioning solutions, what we always do is what we call house styling, which is where you look at things that have a tendency to come out wrong, and instead of trying to fix it in the ASR, you fix it after. And that's really good for fixing something you've seen that's come up today and tends to be being misrecognized in the same way. And we make heavy use of it in our real-time solution especially. Uh, and generally that is quite a fruitful approach, although obviously you need the, that service layer of analyzing where it's going wrong and correcting it. Um, finally, the ASR engines generally allow us to see vocabulary work within custom dictionaries, and that means to tell it what to expect today. And again, this, this can work quite well. It really works especially well where the thing you're trying to recognize is phonetically very unique and not likely to be mistaken for some other word. Where it isn't so unique, you do find that the engines, because it's not quite so contextful, do obsess a bit over those terms. So we have some samples here from where we were trying to use cookery-based vocabulary to get better recognition of cookery terms, and it did recognize more cookery terms correctly, but it also started hearing them everywhere. So instead of can't roll it, you got quite roll it. And my favorite is instead of let us pray before we eat, you got let us spray before we eat. So what can we do about this, Ian? How are we going to fix this one? Yeah, well, so in speech recognition, we have the acoustic models, which are really good at taking the sound he hears and breaking it up into phonemes. But that isn't the whole problem. Breaking up like word boundaries is still a really big issue when you do that as per your sort of letters and letters, letters problems, that's just not enough. And you can't really, very easy, just add new words um, to the dictionary, because you need to know sort of how they're used, what they mean. Um, and I guess the same thing is with humans. If you see a new word written down, you might not know how to say it, or you hear it, you might not know how to spell it. And then as they use it more and more, the way that they get used changes um, through time. So um, understanding your vocabulary is really difficult um, for both humans and for computers. Um, one of the ways that you can start to improve some of those things in the computer models is maybe to break things down into subwords. So if we had a new word that we had known before, say shopping, we could break that into shop and ing. And because we understand in English at least how ing words work, we could uh, make a really good guess at how shopping might work in a more meaningful way than just by breaking it into an unknown word. Um, well, we're beginning to do some of these things, but we actually just need more data to, to do this. There's a learning process, and machine learning was pretty much the same way as humans. The longer it's been about, the more examples we've got of its usage, the better that works. So um, there's a continuous learning process there for, for, for machine learning. But I, I, th I think really on the, um, the human example, if you gave us lots of examples of your, your cooking vocabulary, uh, we could certainly train on that data and make a, make a better job of it. Um, I think um, a lot of it just feels like a tuning issue. So we, we need to tune some of these systems towards some of those some of those use cases, and then it will get better. Is there a limit to how much data we can make use of? Yeah, well, I mean, right now there, there are a few limits. Um, but even with those limits, if you gave us all of your data that was around these, these scenarios, we could do a pretty good job, and certainly a much better job, but probably not that perfect job that we're really after right now. So another significant problem from a captioning point of view is punctuation. Now, in the world of ASR and speech-to-text, this has been hugely neglected over the years because for the measures they were using, it wasn't so important. And for a lot of the use cases for speech-to-text, it just wasn't that important. And you know, for these uses for ads, for example, it's not that important for the text to be punctuated. You just want to understand the meaning, and you just want to get the proper names right. For captioning, it's extremely important. It's very hard for people to parse what's coming out in a real-time solution, for example, if it's not well punctuated. And it's very, very time-consuming for our captioners to correct the punctuation when it's missing, or even when it's incorrect, that can actually be more painful and time-consuming. And anything that is time-consuming has an impact on the cost of the captioning. So it also affects a lot our ability to do automatic segmentation, and again, that just slows down the productivity. So this is something we're seeing a sense that this is improving, that it's getting a bit more in focus. Are you, are you going to say something that's going to make me happy today? I hopefully think I am on this one. I think we'd be a bit more positive. I think from a speech perspective, one of the problems we see is that evaluating it is difficult. I can imagine a, a sentence, 
And I can imagine a sentence that um, I can punctuate in multiple ways is still considered to be accurate. Um, so that becomes very difficult to, to evaluate. I mean, our, our caption is, don't agree that there are multiple valid ways to punctuate a sentence, but I uh, know, as everyone else does. I, I mean, I guess that's ridiculous, because we can take all those preferences from your captions, and this, that's just a, a mapping problem in machine learning, so we can, we can map that punctuation, feed it into the machine learning system, and it could learn that. Um, so, and I don't think that's even a difficult mapping compared to the big space of uh, automatic speech recognition, uh, so much for hardware. So, I think there's probably no reason why, really, that's just not a solved problem. And you're right, punctuation has really been a second class citizen up to this point. We do a great job of speech recognition, and then we just bolt on this post processing thing that tries to understand and put a couple of full stops and a capital letter in there. Um, so, you know, it's not been that great. And it's not just a textual problem either. In some languages, like French, for example, you can say a sentence, and it's just the inflection at the end that turns that sentence into a, into a question. So, there's an audio element to that uh, as well. Um, but I think we have uh, everything that we uh, we need to make punctuation work now, actually. I think it's just an engineering effort. Um, and speech matrix, we're uh, nearly completion of some of that stuff right now. So if you look at this uh, slide here, the top reference side is our uh, punctuated session section, as I would hope one of your captioners would uh, punctuate it. And the middle one here is what happens if you just throw that audio up at the speech matrix at the top today, and you get our sort of best guess of the punctuation that we have today. And it has all stops and things in it, but it's not great. But the bottom there uh, is where we are today. So this adds uh, periods, commas, exclamation marks, question marks, um, and the proof that the, the periods that we've, that we've got in there. So uh, I guess I think that result looks pretty good. Uh, I don't know whether that's good enough for, for where you want to be. I think it looks great. We'd be, we'd be happy to get it. So if we come back to the original question, I mean, I think from my point of view, if we define perfection as the best that human can do today, uh, I think ASR will get there. I mean, there are certain context-dependent things that maybe will take a lot longer, but I think we'll get really, really close in the next five, ten, at most, years. Um, but I think regardless of whether we're going to get there in a bit or not, we shouldn't lose sight of what ASR is doing today. And what ASR is doing today is by making captioning where it wasn't previously feasible available, and by making the captioning where it was available before cheaper. It's increasing coverage in general, and I think for the deaf and the hard of hearing, that's a, that's a really good news story. And you know, captioning is more prevalent than it has ever been, and coverage is just growing and growing and growing, and I think that's great. Cool. And I think from a speech perspective, I think my answer is maybe a bit more independent. I think there's a sort of no aspect to it, but language is constantly evolving and changing very fast. New slang appears, the way that slang is used changes. You know, people mumble. Um, sometimes there's um, more noise than signal, which makes it very difficult to understand. Those problems are not going to go away. Um, but that whole uh, subject of context I've mentioned several times is, a, is, is still a real big, big, uh, big problem with this. I mean, if we had a conversation we might be using information to understand it that was personal to us in the previous conversation I don't know, many, a long time ago, potentially, and there's no way a computer can ever have that information. So there's, there's some challenges there that aren't solvable. But if you do redefine that sort of um, perfection as maybe an 88, 98, 99% uh, accuracy, I think that's good. We, we can really get there as, as uh, this technology grows and moves on, just like humans, we learn a lot through our lifetime, the computers are doing the same, so the model's getting bigger and bigger and better and better, and we're on a great trajectory to, uh, to hit that. I think I can extend that to say that I think if we took the tech and um, uh, algorithms we've got today, <laughs> and just waited 10 years, and now in 10 years' time we've got that, that updated tech and um, um, things, we could turn it back on and just retrain 